Hello, I'm David Rubenstein, and I'm going to be in conversation tonight with Doug Brinkley, who is one of the nation's leading presidential historians, and we're going to talk about his new book, Silent Spring Revolution. We're coming to you from the New York Historical Society's Robert H. Smith Auditorium. Doug, this is an incredibly comprehensive book. Uh, how did you write this while you are doing everything else? How many years did it take to write this? It took me a decade to write Silent Spring Revolution, and it... It kind of was born in my childhood days. I grew up in Ohio, and my mother and father um, were teachers, and we had some weeks off every summer, um, and we would go all over the country in a trailer. And uh, we would, I, I had the, the gift of going to 30 national parks by the time I went to college, um, many historic sites too. And I came up with the idea of doing a trilogy on these waves of conservation movement, first with TR, 1901 to 1909, then the New Deal, FDR era, and what I call the long 60s, 1960 to 1973, which this book's about. So in case somebody did not read the first two parts of your trilogy, um, tell us in a paragraph or two, what did Teddy Roosevelt do that was so um, unusual for a president, and why is he so important in the environmental movement? Theodore Roosevelt was born here in New York City uh, 1858, and in 1859, Charles Darwin had written On the Origins of Species, and it was a revolution. But by telling you that book came out in 1859, it, 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 you know, in the Civil War, people were fighting, killing each other, a country divided. Darwin's studies didn't really track, but young Theodore Roosevelt became a Darwinian. One of the first leavings we have, writings of him, is showing how his brother evolved from a stork and he grew up from a dog. And, uh, and that's because Theodore Roosevelt's father was the leading philanthropist fundraiser for the American Museum of Natural History. And young T.R. then started building his own natural history museum. By the time he goes to Harvard as an undergraduate, he writes his first book, The Summer Birds of the Adirondacks. And he had asthma when he was in a city with unregulated factories and the like around greater New York. But when he was in the Catskills or Adirondacks, he felt nature was a curative. He felt better. And it began a long journey of his whole life of defining himself as an American conservationist and explorer first and foremost. So from 1901 to 09, he saved about 230 million acres of wild America. Um, created the U.S. Forest Service and the progenitor of today's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, where all of us here now own, as American citizens, over 550 national wildlife refuges. TR saved the Grand Canyon, Muir Woods, I could go on. And um, I got going, and I wrote that volume, The Wilderness Warrior, and, uh, and then there was a, a fallow period in conservation, and it boomed again with FDR. Okay, so FDR is thought by most people to be well-known for the... Uh, you know, the New Deal and, and winning World War II and so forth, but people don't realize until they read your book probably that he was quite a conservationist and actually grew up very much committed to conservation and to learning about nature. Is that right? Uh, exactly. So he was born Franklin Roosevelt on the Hudson River, Hyde Park, New York, lived his whole life in Hyde Park and is buried at Hyde Park in our first presidential libraries there along the Hudson. And so today you have scenic Hudson and these groups working to preserve the Hudson. Well, FDR was really a leader of it. But most importantly, he created the Civilian Conservation Corps through the Depression, which with other work program groups, uh, unemployed men got a dollar a day. And their, their primary job was planting trees. And from 1933 to 1942, they planted close to 3 billion trees. Because our depression wasn't just about the Wall Street collapse. We had drained our wetlands. We had a dust bowl in the Great Plains, on and on. And Roosevelt addressed all that with massive conservation programs. Some of his key parks, like the Smoky Mountains, Everglades, Channel Island, get some press. But he also founded 800 state parks during the, the New Deal. So uh, when he passes away, uh, Harry Truman becomes president. Harry Truman isn't famous for environmental protection, perhaps, and he actually is famous for doing one thing, at least, that some people think was one of the most environmentally dangerous things ever done. He drops two nuclear weapons or bombs on Japan. Can you talk about that and why people at the time weren't as knowledgeable about the radiation effects and why he continued to have atomic tests afterwards? 
Well, as Franklin Roosevelt famously said, Dr. New Deal himself has to become Dr. Win the War. And Roosevelt did not invest properly in World War II on missiles. Hitler did, the V-2 and all of this. But what he did do well, Roosevelt, was invest in the Manhattan Project and the development of nuclear weapons, which came to fruition a bomb that we detonated at the Trinity site in New Mexico in the summer of 1945, right when Truman was negotiating for post-war peace in Germany. And Truman green lights the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Most Americans cheered, VJ Day, soldiers say, we don't have to island hop or invade the Japanese mainland. But by nature, once you know John Hershey of the New Yorker and others started showing photographs of radiation and we got dug deeper as investigators of what occurred, there was a fear that we've now entered a very dangerous stage in human life, the atomic age. And it becomes the, the rub of these conservation activists of the late 1940s and 1950s because the United States from 1945 to 1992 detonated 1,054 nuclear bombs and tests. And the state that got the brunt of it was Nevada at the uh, Nevada test site. Um, and there was a group of what I would call public scientists, science information movement of the 40s and 50s that said, we've got to ban the testing of nuclear weapons. And of course, Russia's doing the same and it'll come to fruition with John F. Kennedy when he brilliantly negotiates the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty of 1963. So, as far as the environmental movement as it's moving forward, what did Truman do? The Bureau of Land Management was created under his uh, tenure. Was that a good or bad thing? It's a, BLM does great work, but on public lands, which is most of the West, if you go to Nevada or Idaho, it's you know two thirds, three quarters of the state owned by the federal government, how much of that land do you save as, as sacrosanct, as nature sanctuaries, as roadless wilderness, as national park lands, and how much do you extract from the land? And depending on the president, you can go in different directions and use our public lands. Truman was more like the conservative business community, and are you kidding me? We're bottling up these natural resources. We need uranium, we need zinc, we need asbestos, we need copper, we need to increase timber. At our best, our country does a nice balance of this, um, but there are certain moments in American history, particularly Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt, when it peaks for the conservation community, and Truman and Eisenhower are quite similar in that they're leaning more towards the immediate jobs, economic boon of extraction. So let's talk about Eisenhower. Eisenhower becomes president, not a famous environmentalist before that. Um, he begins the interstate highway system. Is that a good thing for the environment or not? Interstate, the interstate highway is probably not great for the environment, um, but it's a great for American commerce. I mean, it gave birth to our modern day trucking industry. It gave birth to uh, industrial parks. It gave birth to satellite communities, suburbia. We can go on and on. It changed America's lives. But it was, Eisenhower was a logistics maven, and he wanted it done. He built quickly, and it got built quickly, and we didn't do a great job on urban planning on some of it meaning neighborhoods like Storyville in New Orleans where jazz was born, just the, the, the you know, I-10 just rips and devastates the community. But while the interstate was being built in the 50s, a wilderness lobby came out, which is a leftover from FDR, and it's led by the Sierra Club, David Brower, and a man named uh, Howard Zahnizer of the Wilderness Society. And they're very good at politics, and they're saying, we've got to put aside roadless wilderness and we need a wilderness act. And it starts in the 50s. The big showdown is in a place none of you have probably heard about, Dinosaur National Monument in the mid-1950s, because martial monuments are supposed to be preserved, public lands, for re outdoor recreation, scenic reasons. And instead, the Eisenhower administration and others were starting to build a dam that would have ruined the monument. And they take out full page ads, the Green Movement, Ansel Adams, the great photographer doing photos. And, and the full page ads are saying, you'll destroy the whole national park system if you allow this dam. They won. The, the environmentalists win. There is no dam to ruin dinosaur. And that puts fuel in the tank of what becomes the Wilderness Act of 1964 that Lyndon Johnson signs 
and puts aside 9.0 million acres of wilderness lands without roads. The problem with roads are if you build a roads, it's not just you have to put in restrooms, then utility poles, and before long the logging trucks come. So there are designations all across the United States, like the Bob Marshall Wilderness in Montana, you're dealing with millions of acres where you can just only hike, hunt, or fish, but you're not allowed to have mechanized vehicles enter that. So also during his administration, uh, President Eisenhower um, uh, okayed the uh, continued uh, development of nuclear weapons by testing outside, outdoors, is that right? They yes. Were, he didn't, there were people that said, let's not do this so much, let's not have testing, but he continued to do it, is that right? Yes, and we were doing uh, willy-nilly blowing up bombs and, and on nuclear bombs in America, and it was blowing and contaminating. Martin Luther King Jr. famously says, what good does it do to me to integrate a lunch counter if the milk we're drinking has a stratum 90 in it? Okay, so let's talk about President Kennedy. He's growing up in Massachusetts largely. Um, is he a big environmentalist as a young man? And was he really that focused on those issues at that time? He was not. And I'm not even sure it was ever really his thing in any way. But the one who was a conservationist for sure, particularly Seashore, is Rose Kennedy, his mother. And so it's Jack Kennedy as a senator with his mother cheering him on. And Kennedy cuts his teeth, you know, and, and makes impact by promoting as a senator saving of Cape Cod. In his first year in the White House, he saves Cape Cod National Seashore and then Padre Island National Seashore in Texas and uh, Point Reyes National Seashore in Marin County, California. These are high real estate valued areas. It's easy to go save a hunk of the Brooks Range and, and run your acreage up as president. But to actually negotiate, like for Cape Cod with the cities of Turo and Wellfleet and Provincetown and get this park and dunes surrounding communities was really an incredible feat. But his most important environmental achievement, without doubt, is the limited, uh, the nuclear test ban treaty. Can you explain what that was about and why he was so proud of it? Kennedy was, as we all know, shocked by the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, we almost came to war. And his takeaway, to his credit, is he listened to protest. I write in the book about a group called Women Strike for Peace, protesting, stopping, banning the bomb. Credit Scott King's going to Geneva, stop testing nuclear weapons. And Kennedy takes them seriously, the anti-bomb movement, if you'd like. And um, he sends as his, a, as his covert secret ambassador with nobody knowing at state CIA, the editor Norman Cousins to negotiate with Khrushchev and the Pope on finding a way to get both Russia and the United States to ban testing of nuclear weapons after. In, after in the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, that we still could do nuclear testing underground. But it was that atmospheric blow, the downwinders of people getting sick um, from it, and it was showing itself in tundra in Alaska or wheat fields in, in Kansas. And Kennedy drove that home on his own. So President Kennedy was very interested in this, and he gave a speech at American University where he was outlining what he really thought we should do in a test ban treaty, and it, the, the Soviets picked it up. Is that right? Yeah, Pravda loved it, <laughs> and it went on all the Russian radio. My God, Kennedy's really serious about banning nuclear weapons, and uh, and he did it. So we now know that the underground testing isn't so safe either, because we have all kinds of information <laughs> that shows that when you do underground testing, it does pollute the the land, and ultimately it seeps up. So it does. Uh, now there's not as much underground testing either. Is that right? There's not, and it's probably not a good idea to test it at all. When you do an underground, it seeps, it hits water supplies, it's problematic, but it's better than it would be if it were in the air all the time. So Johnson becomes president, and he wants to do a number of things to fulfill the legacy of President Kennedy, and one of them is the wilderness bill you talked about earlier. Uh, he actually pushes that through. So Lady Bird Johnson wants a project. Uh, uh, Mrs. Kennedy had a project to uh, improve the White House. What is the project that Lady Bird takes on to produce uh, let's say beautification in Washington initially? Well, Lady Bird, she's an important part of my book because um, Lyndon Johnson could be more transactional about things. But what her big thing was what I would call, the, she was anti-ugly. Um, <laughs> she didn't like seeing ticky-tack developments and roads. She, she much preferred the Blue Ridge Parkway or Taconic. 
in New York area, and was wondering, is there a way after the interstate highway system has ruined these things that we get control over roadside beautification? She started fighting for against the billboard lobby on roads, um, but she also promoted wildflowers along scenic areas. So in your book, you point out that uh, the president wanted the Highway Beautification Act passed and it wasn't going so well, so he calls his cabinet together and says, get this done in the next week or so because Lady Bird really wants it, and if she wants it, I want it. <laughs> uh, he had told Lady Bird, no matter what, he's getting this, this done for her. And my God, he rattled cages in Washington to get it done. And I write in the book, there are some of these beautiful, spontaneous moments of Lyndon talking about natural beauty, but the problem was the Vietnam War uh, because here we are spraying Agent Orange over jungles in Vietnam, and how are you an environmentalist at home because you're saving a new national park or a, a, a wild and scenic river? So up until my book, I feel Lady Bird's caught some credit, but I, I feel I've given Lyndon proper credit for many of the initiatives he did, uh, uh, not just the Wilderness Act, roadless wilderness, but wild and scenic rivers, parts of our rivers that will stay pristine with federal protection. The Trails Act? Trails Act. Lyndon Johnson signed that and saved the Appalachian Trail of today, the Pacific Crest Trail, and all these trail systems, Mormon Trail, Oregon Trail, you know, Santa Fe Trail, and Lyndon, Lyndon is a progenitor of that. And what about the uh, Endangered Species Act? Endangered Species, Lyndon Johnson, 1966, in its first manifestation, um, and they're trying to um, listen to what we call the bedroll scientist the people that are living in far-flung places and what species are really in peril. We started now looking to save a lot of, uh, you know, not just the eagles and crisis and, and hawks, but alligator and manatee and, you know, um, grizzlies and on and on the list go. And then that 66 Endangered Species Act gets updated in 69. And then the one we're living by today is the 1973 agreement, um, which passed during Nixon's presidency. So let's talk about President Nixon. Uh, people may remember him for many things, but maybe he doesn't get the credit that he deserves, some people would say, for all the environmental things that happened during his administration. So why don't we go through some of the most amazing ones of them? So when, what you uh, call, I think, in the Magna Carta of Environmental Legislation, the NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act, is passed under President Nixon. What does the NEPA actually do? The biggest thing NEPA, as some people call it, um, is it demanded environmental impact statements. So let's just say if the Department of Defense wanted to build an Air Force base in order before they could build it at a location, and much more, I'm just giving you, they would have to have environmentalist scientists say, here's the environmental damage a project will do. Well, NEPA creates the Magna Carta because suddenly it opens up a new field, environmental law. He also created the EPA, which was not created, as you point out in your book, by legislation. He kind of created it by executive order. Is that right? That's right. Out of his own White House. Um, following NEPA, you had Earth Day in April of 1970, and that was John, Mayor Lindsay here in New York, blocked off roads just like, you know, going on now for holidays and all. And, uh, and it became giant covered on television. Uh, a new bunch of environmental music was coming out. Marvin Gaye, Mercy Me, The Ecology, or Pete Seeger stepping up to save the Hudson, the, the great legendary folk singer. Uh, and books started pouring out, you know, like Desert Solitaire by Edward Abbey and Paul Ehrlich, The Population Bomb, and uh, Stuart Brand's A Whole Earth Catalog. And it just mushroomed by that Earth Day, and uh, they cobbled together today's EPA, and it, it, it's done in the summer of 70, and it opens its doors in December 70. So also during the Nixon administration, the Clean uh, Air Act and the Clean Water Act are passed, and how did those transformative pieces of legislation happen during the Nixon administration? Was it only the Republicans were pushing it, or were the Democrats pushing for it as well? But both parties, I mean, Ralph Nader's book in 1960 called Unsafe at Any Speed really really jarred the auto industries. And it was about automobile safety, but in the end, uh, it led to a conversations about creating a Department of Transportation. Um, and it also led to getting lead out of gasoline. And um, the reports of, of how poison the air was in Los Angeles in particular, but also New York and elsewhere, 
um, started leading a public consensus that we need to um, do something about automobile emissions. And Nixon signs it in 1970, and it's still very powerful, the Clean Air Act today, just like NEPA. And then the Clean Water Act doesn't pass till 1972. Talk about a few people who are in the book who are not presidents. You, you kind of built it around presidents, but talk about some individuals and what their impact was on the environment. Who was Rachel Carson and what was her impact? Well, this book couldn't have been written without Rachel Carson. She's a giant figure, and it was a joy to be able to write a book with a woman front and center. Carson was born in Springdale, Illinois. Um, she was attuned to the natural world when she was young. She saw the beautiful Allegheny River of western Pennsylvania being destroyed by industrial factories, uh, unregulated uh, sewage dumpage. Remember, we don't do sewage treatment plants well until the 1970s in America. But she wanted to be a naturalist or and a writer and a scientist. And she went to Chatham, a school outside of Pittsburgh, and then goes to the great place, Woods Hole, in Massachusetts, near Hyannisport in Cape Cod. And that's where it would draw all the best people that wanted to go into ocean conservation or ocean science. She was a lifelong Audubon birder, but mainly her gift like Darwin, is she wrote scientifically exact prose, almost like one of the best novelists you've ever seen. And her big breakthrough was an essay called Undersea in the Atlantic. And from 1941 to the late 50s, she wrote a sea trilogy, three books I recommend to everybody. There, it's You can't find somebody who writes it with the integrity of our oceans like Rachel Carson does even today. So the most famous book she wrote was Silent Spring, and it refers to the silence that you hear from, you don't hear birds or anything because the birds are dying uh, during springtime because of DDT. She basically says DDT is killing people and killing wildlife, is that right? That's right. And she worked for Franklin D. Roosevelt during World War II in U.S. Fish and Wildlife. FDR created an amazing place called Pawtuxet, Maryland. It's there today, we own it, it's ours. There at the river and the forest, we test chemicals to see what will contaminate water supplies. What mixture of things we're putting in rivers and lakes will make wildlife species sick or even go extinct. And she worked there in World War II and found out that there was a little cabal of scientists there that said this DDT is a very bad for um, all for what sauna. was DDT used for during World War II? It was used to kill insects, and it was highly effective, and it particularly helped, you know, something like John F. Kennedy or um, Nixon or Johnson going to the Pacific Theater probably would have been sprayed down with DDT to kill off ticks, lice, mosquitoes. Very effective. It was a big agent of the war, but it wasn't regulated, and our country thought it was, it was, it was called like presto, chemistry miracle. No more of these pesky you know, insects. And so the United States Department of Agriculture and other counties uh, would start spraying it over crops. And the real scientists knew this was a problem. It was starting to kill off eagle populations, osprey, on and on the list you go. Carson tried to write about it in 45 for Reader's Digest, and they rejected her. So she kept writing about the oceans. But in the late 1950s, a woman named Marjorie Spock on Long Island was an organic farmer. And she was, her brother was Dr. Benjamin Spock, the baby doctor. And Marjorie Spock said, I have a, a constitutional right to be an organic farmer, and yet these crop planes are pouring these pesticides on my organic farm. She sues and takes it to the Supreme Court and loses. But Rachel Carson inherits all of that, the, the legal findings, and the shining moment was William O. Douglas, Supreme Court Justice. He wrote a dissent backing the banning of DDT and backing Spock and, and, and then became a cheerleader for what Rachel Carson was doing. But it was controversial because the chemical industry said, well, it's actually a really good chemical and doing good, good things. So it wasn't so easy. In fact, it, DDT wasn't banned for quite some time. Is that right? Exactly. I mean, Carson's book comes out in 62. But as I write in my book about DDT wars, it does not get banned in North America or the United States right. um, until 1972 under President Nixon. And the, the real leader of the eventual ban was William Ruckel's house, our country's first head of EPA. Let's talk about another individual uh, you just mentioned, William O. Douglas. He's throughout your book, 
Were you surprised at how much influence he had when he was a Supreme Court justice? He's doing all these environmental things. How did he get away with doing it in those days? <laughs> it's the greatest question you can ever ask. Um, it's mind boggling. But Bill Douglas from Yakima, Washington, um, grew up poor, had a crippling polio-like condition and learned to mountain climb in uh, places in the Pacific Northwest, Mount Adams and Mount Baker and Mount Rainier. And he came into New York City from the West um, and became a star at Columbia and, and law and then became Sterling Professor of Law at Yale. Douglas is a genius. I don't use that word often when I talk. But he was a, he was, um, a wild maverick-like figure and his love was for the outdoors. In fact, in 1951, as Supreme Court Justice, he went to the Himalayan mountains and became a Buddhist and, uh, and wrote a book called The Himalayans. And then he would write books called My Wilderness about all of these special places, two of them in the United States. He even at one point tells um, a, a law friend, a lawyer friend, I'm gonna ask Supreme Court Justice, he says, I'm gonna bend the law all the way in favor of the environmental movement. And he goes to work at it, and he's a public relations boon. If you, if you have a cause, if Douglas reads about it, he would find a way to influence Eric Severide at CBS or the John Oates at the New York Times, or he had all of these people. In many ways, Douglas, and he's the one who backs Carson's action so much, he's triggering a new environmental awareness. His heroes are FDR, and Gifford Pinchot and Theodore Roosevelt, uh, and it's FDR who had appointed him to the Supreme Court in 1937. He replaced Brandeis. Yes. And he served uh, how many years on the court? 37 years. He's uh, uh, the uh, longest uh, for any associate justice. The longest. And who was Barry Commoner? Barry Commoner is a really unusual story. He grew up in Brooklyn, Jewish family, science genius. Um, and in World War II, he did his doctorate at Harvard. Um, he was a biologist slash uh, uh, expert on anything to do with, uh, with air and water issues. And in World War II, he helped devise the mechanism on our planes to spray DDT. But he was such a smart scientist that after the war, he also started studying and realized that both atomic weapons fallout and DDT were detrimental to human existence. And what he did cleverly from Washington University in St. Louis is he collected baby teeth from areas that were, were saved before radiation and then baby teeth after. Uh, it's called the baby tooth survey. And he started building up public momentum to saying we must stop atmospheric and underwater testing of bombs and DDT gets banned. And as a scientist, he had an influence. And by 1970, Commoners on the cover of Time Magazine as the Paul Revere of ecology. So you've spent 10 years putting this together. Uh, it's many hundreds of pages, very comprehensive. It's a, it's a terrific book. I want to thank you for being here in a really interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you, David.